Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight I'll talk with political analyst Alan Lickman. He's author of a book, The 13 Keys to the White House. It's about his system that has correctly predicted the outcomes of every U.S. presidential election since 1984. He's been doing this show since the 92 election, got every one of them right, and he'll give us tonight his prediction on 2012. Stay with us. Then we'll take a look at the situation in Iraq in light of the official end of the war. We'll do that with Fuad Hussein. He's chief of staff to Masoud Barzani, president of the Kurdistan region. But first, an analysis of the latest developments in the campaign. Uh, along the trail, I want to welcome John Zogby, founder of Zogby International, where it's columns uh, for Forbes.com, U.S. News and World Report, and Campaigns and Elections magazine. He's the author of The Way Will Be, the Zogby Report on the Transformation of the American Dream. And I want to start with asking you about Iowa and New Hampshire. Everyone is sort of focused on them, uh, a little late actually, less money being spent than ever before. Um, but are, are they still important? Are they still decisive in presidential politics? They're important and they can be decisive. So, but they're important in the sense that the, you have a winnowing out process. So you start with eight candidates this year and you'll have fewer after Iowa and you'll have even fewer after New Hampshire. And voters in those two states happen to take the responsibility very seriously. Um, Pawlenty already left because of, 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 of Iowa. Um, the, the, let me do this. Go back in history uh, and give me a few <clears throat> examples of the role that Iowa plays. Because we've got that one coming up January 3rd. It's the first one. What what are some examples of what has happened to show what role it plays? 1984 Democrats. Walter Mondale is leading in the polls nationally and in Iowa. He has over 50 percent of the vote. Everybody else is in single digits. Iowa caucuses. Fellow named Gary Hart, Senator Hart, gets 14 percent. Mondale gets under 50, 45 percent. That was enough to rule uh, that Mondale was wounded and two weeks later, Gary Hart wins the New Hampshire primary. Now, Mondale went on to win the, New Ham uh, to win the, uh, the nomination, but Iowa was a very important uh, part of the, of, of the puzzle. Um, 1992, um, Bill Clinton lost Iowa. Iowa wasn't important that year. There was a senator from Iowa, Tom Harkin, running. But the very next week, Clinton comes in second place in New Hampshire after he had been determined dead by the press, and he became the comeback kid. So it's a game of perceptions, not just winning. Uh, let's walk through some scenarios right now. Let's put a poll up. Here's what we've got as the latest Iowa poll um, that we've. Uh, it's Gingrich 22, Paul 21, Romney 16, and Bachman 11. Um, say we get that outcome. What's that say? Well, I mean, essentially what it says is that Gingrich wins, but he's wounded because he'd been polling much higher nationally. And, uh, so and does Paul win the perceptions game? Paul wins the perceptions game doing better than anticipated. Romney's a big loser. Um, remember, these are polling numbers, and it's early, but at the same time, this is all about level of organization and the ability to get your voters out on a cold day. To Talk to me about that. It's, re it's, it's stated that, yep. that Ron Paul has 20,000 signed up caucus goers. Mm -hmm. um, what if he comes out of Iowa the winner? What could happen? Wow. Uh, it wounds Gingrich, perhaps permanently. He, he becomes the conservative alternative. So does Gingrich have to win Iowa? He has to win Iowa, absolutely. So he's in the position that Bachman was in uh, a while back. Gingrich has to win Iowa. Romney, however, you know, if, if those numbers hold true, then Romney is severely wounded and now uh, moderate Republicans or establishment Republicans are saying, you know, we can't nominate Ron Paul. We need an alternative who can win. Then it, you know, perhaps that's the John Huntsman scenario there, although mm -hmm. John Huntsman possibly does very well in New Hampshire, but you have to ask where does he go from there? South Carolina, Florida, you know, some of the bigger states. Mm -hmm. uh, it th if Ron Paul wins in Iowa, it could throw things really in a tizzy. Now let's go through each of the candidates because 
uh, we've we've still got six on the stage where there's a debate later on tonight mm -hmm. um, and the question is um, uh, are they serious or are they a distraction mm -hmm. is there a reason for them to be there or are they just taking up space we've had that in Republican and Democratic primaries before where you know the, the, you know as much as I m might like uh, Chris Dodd or you know respect some of the the folks who ran on the other side uh, th they were just uh, th some of them don't even remember their names uh, shortly after the primaries over there was a California Republican congressman running last time don't still don't remember his name um, obviously Romney and and Gingrich are are, mm -hmm. are, are serious uh, folks right now uh, mm -hmm. whether you like them or not uh, Ron Paul they say he cannot win is that true? And, and if so, what's he doing in this race? He probably can't win, more, more than likely, but he can do a lot of damage to front runners. And what he also does that no one else does on the Republican side is he, he is very appealing to young people. There's a difference between young people in 2008 who were very hopeful and invested a lot in Barack Obama. Young people today finding it very hard to get started during this recession and are not really in love with any of the major parties. If Ron Paul wins in Iowa, does respectably elsewhere, and decides later to run a third party, he takes a lot of young people with him and throws this race really into a tizzy. Uh, Michelle Bachman. Is she real or is she a distraction at this oh, point? Oh, no, no, no. I think she's back to real. You see this poll, she's at 11%. She's um, a Minnesotan, bo actually born in Iowa. And uh, there's got to be a Christian candidate in, in all of this who does well. Uh, Michelle Bachman, of course, could be that one. She also has a pretty good organization. Let's look then at Rick Santorum, uh, who keeps promising to rise, doesn't rise. Uh, the evangelical movement in Iowa, which actually we first discovered as important in 88 with uh, Pat Robertson's race when he I think came in second place uh, he, uh, Pat Robertson won one Iowa in 1988 and yep. used it to build a Christian coalition that's what led Huckabee to uh, uh, yep. his his victory so if they come out and endorse Santorum is he real does he go on beyond Iowa he doesn't have money doesn't have organization is he real or a distraction you know aside from Huntsman who is not campaigning in Iowa at all nobody's at one percent so the poll we just put up didn't go down that far, but Santorum's showing up at 6 or 7 percent, which is enough to suggest that, you know, if Gingrich fails between now and, and um, uh, January 3rd, uh, that those Christian votes could, uh, could very well go to, it, it's almost like whose turn is it, you know? No one else is on the ballot. Now we've gotten down to the yeses, Santorum. I was looking at a, a, a poll chart uh, uh, this election uh, since the beginning of it and it's a series of bell curves one after another yep. with one you know first Donald Trump went up and then down and and then Michelle Bachman went up and went down and then Herman Cain went up and went down now Gingrich is up and he's beginning to slide down so the question is is there time for somebody else to go up and down and Iowa could be it let's talk about John let me Huntsman. just make one other thing yeah. though 42, 44 percent of Republican primary voters nationwide, and also Iowa and New Hampshire, are not, not satisfied with the field. Mm. So there, there's even more fluidity here. Let's look at the last one in, the, in yeah. this mix, uh, which is John Huntsman. Uh, real or a distraction? No, he could be real. I don't see him winning the nomination, but he could mm. conceivably set the table for a future run if as he banks on, he wins New Hampshire or does very well in New Hampshire. I forgot Rick Perry, uh, who was one of the ones who went up and then came down rather precipitously. Um, does he get over the bad debate performances? Does he get over the fact that he doesn't seem to be able without a, a coaching to do two sentences together well? It doesn't look like it because these debates appear to be more important and actually are getting decent viewership than ever before, particularly among the Republican audiences and he's not connecting. He's, he has gone way down, plateaued eight, nine, ten percent. Um, that is not someone who, someone who has as much money as he has can't survive with an eight, nine, ten percent showing. If you want to get in the conversation out there, give us a call. If you're calling from overseas, it's 001-202-420-5665. If you're calling from here in the U.S., the number is 
420-5730. I want to put up a series of polls right now, have you look at them and tell me what you think. First is the overall Gingrich versus Romney numbers. Uh, we're going to get them up on the board right now. And it shows Romney, we've seen from the beginning, never went above 23, 24%, 25, something like that. It was mm -hmm. probably the highest he ever did. Gingrich shot way up. And here's a, a, mm -hmm. a Gingrich 40%, Romney 23%. But when they run against Obama, mm -hmm. uh, Romney comes close or beats them in several general polls. Um, Obama decisively whips uh, uh, Gingrich. Does this mean that the Republican field, it, that the Republican electorate is just way off to the, the right and that the guy who wins there can't win the center? A couple of quick responses to that. That 40 to 23 Gingrich over Romney, that was then. Mm -hmm. That was taken a week ago. Uh, what you're seeing is a, is a tightening up. Again, not Romney moving, but Gingrich Dropping. going down. Yeah. Gallup poll has him at 8%. But the Obama-Gingrich number is 51-40. Eight, meaning the gap between the two. Eight, the, the yeah. eight, eight points, the, yeah. the gap. The, the difference here is that nationwide voters uh, uh, are telling us that, um, that I lost my point. But uh, no, nationwide voters are, are, are telling us, uh, Republicans, they're more interested in somebody who agrees with them than beating Obama. Now, I saw that late 2003 with Howard Dean. So, two to one, they wanted somebody who stood by principles uh, over somebody who, who could beat George W. Mm -hmm. Bush. As soon as we started polling, daily tracking in January in Iowa, that flipped two to one. They then wanted somebody who could beat George W. Bush. So we've got to wait and see if that's what if Republicans are going to turn it's around. It's now getting it. nasty. Uh, Romney calling Gingrich zany, and yep. I think many would agree that he, he is. He, some weird pronouncements along the way, some very hurtful ones as well. Got a very strange uh, marital life. He mm -hmm. still has that that issue in what led him to have to resign as Speaker of the House, the financial scandals that have not been talked about much at and all. And angered a lot of his caucus. Uh, They're coming back. Almost yeah. no, uh, no support among guys he served with in Congress. Um, are voters willing to forgive all that? Uh, do they turn a blind eye to it? Uh, or does that haunt him to the end? Uh, if, he w if he goes on to win the nomination, it haunts him till the end. We have to see, though, uh, what the Tea Party influence is going to be. If the Tea Party influence stays strong, it bolsters up a conservative alternative to Romney or, or Huntsman. Uh, bottom line is, I think we've seen Newt Gingrich peaking. Now, can he hold on to, to January 3rd? That's, uh, we don't know. But this is the dilemma the Republicans face. If they choose a conservative candidate that appeals to the Tea Party, they isolate the party and they open the door actually for a centrist independent candidate. So it's like Delaware in the last election or it's like Nevada in the last yep. election. They pick somebody that they like, mm -hmm. but the general electorate won't like and it helps a weak incumbent win. Right. Or, you know, the flip side of that is a little earlier that, that uh, Ron Paul does very well and then decides on his own to break some of that libertarian conservative vote, which is not as large as the, the, the Tea Party itself, but he gets a lot of Tea Party sympathizers plus question. young people. If you go for way too long with this thing, um, and it drags out and nobody seems to be doing well, is there a chance that somebody new gets in? Is there a chance for a brokered convention with some one of the guys who didn't run? Or will that just anger the heck out of people who've been running and working hard and who have devoted followings, despite being in the 20% range, say, we, we work too hard for you to come up with, uh, uh, you know, Chris Christie or Mitch Daniels or one of these guys? The bottom line is both. That what happens is, yes, the establishment goes into the cigar smoke-filled room and finds a Chris Christie or a Mitch Daniels. But it angers the Tea Party and it angers the candidates who've been out there. And it's a bad scenario. It's, it's hard to see a good scenario for Republicans, except that 19, 20 percent think the country is headed uh, in the right direction. Over 70 percent say it's in the wrong direction. So Obama hasn't closed the deal. Let's go to Arizona for a call. Caller? 
Yes, uh, I just want to say that uh, I support Ron Paul because he's the only Republican candidate that doesn't support the Jewish state because the Jewish state killed 20,000 Christians and Muslims. And I noticed that the Israeli lobby like, makes him like he's nothing. And I think he's the only one that actually has the, he wants to have peace in the world and not fight the, the wars for Jewish people or other people. He just wants to have peace. And I think he realizes and touches the hearts of people that see the mm -hmm. injustice going on in the Middle East. We're but, just finishing up with Iraq. The only reason we went to Iraq, if you ask me, is because Saddam Hussein sent a couple of Scud missiles to Tel Aviv, and that's why the soonest opportunity that we can get, we attacked Iraq. And I support Ron Paul thank because you. he's the only person the that has any th common sense. Th thank you. Uh, given the wars, given everything that's happened, does this isolationist current that Ron Paul represents in the beginning of the debates was really quite interesting. There were at least three of the candidates, I recall, saying bring the boys home from Afghanistan and Iraq, end it all. They were, they were on that isolationist track. They've now all abandoned it except for Ron Paul. Does isolationism win on the, on the Republican or even on the national side? Not uh, in and of itself it doesn't. I think where Ron Paul does well is on the authenticity side. What you see is what you get. You're, you're not going to get a flip-flopper in Ron Paul. You, what you have essentially is someone who's been consistent from the first day that he entered Congress to the debate tonight. And authenticity, I think, is, is something that plays very well with him. And I think in particular with young people. Answer your question directly, isolationism, not particularly a winner. Last week, we had all of the candidates before the Republican Jewish Coalition, except Ron Paul, didn't get invited because they said he was out of the mainstream. Um, a lot of heads were scratching at some of the things that got said, some of the things that got done at, at this. Um, and my question is, there are no Jewish votes in this Republican primary. Mm -hmm. Worry about it. This was about the evangelical right, wasn't it? It was. Did it work? Did it work? Um, you know, in the sense that to the national audience, to Tea Party people, um, yeah, you know, to, to social conservatives, you saw each candidate following up and endorsing what, what Newt Gingrich said. Uh, or if not going so far as Newt Gingrich, at least in endorsing a hard pro-Israel stance, mm -hmm. that is obviously for, for the Christian uh, right, uh, Christian conservative vote. Let's go to California for a call. Caller? Hello? Hi, yeah, your question? Yeah, I got a question. I wonder if the crazy Republican going to the right so far like they are, is it going to be like the end of the Gilded Age where the Republicans just became a non-party for like 60 years? Nobody voted for them, nobody cared about them. They were so out of touch with everybody else. Well, they did pretty well in 2010. That was, a, that, that was an issue, but what do well, you say to that? We're talking about after the Gilded Age. Though, right, you know, okay. Way back there in the Depression. Okay, John? Over 60 years. Vote for the Republicans. I, I think taking a longer view, you have to, you do have to look at four key get demographic groups that are growing in terms of their role in the electorate. Um, and I won't go so far as to say that young people, Hispanics, African Americans, the creative class, knowledge, uh, and arts workers um, are permanently Democrat. Uh, I think the Democrats have to earn their support and their enthusiasm, but clearly I, I do see a scenario where the Republicans, um, the Republicans could find themselves out of business. 2010 was important for them, but that's because so many of those Democratic constituencies stayed home in 2010. Talk about Americans elect. Um, yeah. Is that real or is that a distraction? We don't know, honestly. What we do know is that America... And let me just for our viewers, that's the new effort at a An national online. nominating uh, party yeah. uh, that is now getting on the ballot in several states. I suspect that, that, um, that it's very real because the technology is very real and, it, and always have thought that online technology um, and, and handheld technology is going to change our, our democracy. Um, but by the same token, there, there's something that worries me. You, you know, the Founding Fathers created um, uh, an electoral college, you know, as a hedge against too much popular 
democracy mm -hmm. and the potential to elect you know a demagogue of some sort and so it's something I think that is and will be important but it has to be watched thank you so much for joining us John Zogby uh, when we come back I'm going to be talking with political analyst Alan Lickman getting his prediction on the 2012 ele uh, 12 election and more of your calls uh, stay with us